If we go back historically, conservatorship was meant to be a good thing. I didn't know what a trustee was supposed to be doing. That's why I hired them. My mother has lost her family. I think there's some very honest people, but this is a flaw in our system. And that's the problem. You look at the motivation. Until a person goes through this personally, they can't believe that these things are going on. My mom's name is Linda Duncan. My mom and dad met in the 50s and it was a classic love story. 30 years his wife senior Lisa said her father made sure his wife was set in the likely event he passed away before her, even purchasing a home in Camarillo for the two to live their final years out together. We always assumed that mom and dad would spend their last years in this beautiful view house. Um, and my dad did. But Linda didn't. So I'm going to meet Lisa right now to join her on her visit with her mother so I can hear directly from Linda herself. And I'm gonna use my phone to record our conversation. Tell you, Lisa, I um, had the most wonderful life. We'll finish. Mm -hmm. And to be we'll finish shot the down here like this is just kind of a, right. a sad situation. It wouldn't be so bad if I could come out. 20 years after her husband passed, Linda has been placed in an assisted living facility in Auburn. Hundreds of miles from the home her and her husband shared, Lisa says she's there against her wishes. I think she's unhappy in that situation, and she much would prefer to be in her own home. I don't know what's going to happen to me. I'm going to deteriorate, I tell you. The reason Linda cannot return home is because she's under a conservatorship. A conservatorship is when another person is appointed by a judge to have legal authority over someone's life. Conservatorships are more common with aging adults suffering from dementia or other health issues that prevent them from taking care of themselves. She didn't want her father to be conservative. Conservatorships have made headlines recently with the popular documentary Framing Britney Spears and the Golden Globe winning film I Care A Lot. The court has appointed me to be your legal guardian. What? But conservatorships aren't new, and it's a powerful position. This process is going to take away your mom's rights. If you become her conservator, now your mom enters into what some people call civil death. While family members can also be appointed conservators, if a court appoints a third-party conservator, it'll be a fiduciary, which is a profession of handling other people's money, but it's also the specific certification needed to become a third-party conservator. According to the Professional Fiduciary Bureau, this industry manages just under $13 billion of other people's assets in California alone. And conservatorships may be on the rise as we're entering into the silver tsunami, a term describing the age baby boomer generation. You've been disinherited. Now you're facing an uphill battle. Mike Hacker got his start in land use law, but when trust issues came up in his own family, he felt helpless and confused despite having an extensive law background. That's why he changed specialties and has spent the last 40 years in trust and estate law. Well, there are two kinds of conservatorships. Uh, there's a conservatorship of the person. A conservatorship of a person means someone oversees all personal aspects of your life. Everything from what you eat, where you live, your medical care, to even who you're able to see. That is different than the conservatorship for financing. The other type of conservatorship is of an estate, where another person has full power over all your financial affairs and assets. Takes over everything that you own and all of the rights that you have to ownership. And these two types of conservatorships aren't exclusive. They're often paired together. And in my view, when they are paired together, the conservatee often becomes invisible. They're in their own prison in a way because the conservator the person controls all access to them. So what time do you normally have to leave by? Um, I have to leave, like, not a minute later than 9.45, typically. Julie's race against the clock is a weekly event, driving from Marin to Sacramento. No, I just, my heart is racing because, um, I just don't want to get there even a minute late, since I only have 30 minutes. 
It's 30 minutes of time with her mother for four hours of driving. There was no flexibility for my arriving late or if there was a car accident. We also weren't allowed to bring any friends with us and we were also not permitted to bring any food or drink. Rules she must follow despite this visit being extra special. Happy birthday, Mom! Julie's visits are at the home where she grew up. At our time of filming, due to COVID-19, she had to remain outside, only permitted to see her mother through the window. She's not allowed to stay five minutes past visitation time or arrive early. This shouldn't be allowed to happen to anyone. Prisoners, <laughs> prisoners, people who are incarcerated, get more visitation time than my mother does. Happy birthday to you. I love you. <laughs> but it wasn't always like this. There you go. Get down, Mama. Julie used to take care of her mother, but a $300,000 loan from Julie's mother, Carol, changed everything. I was purchasing a, a condominium up in Marin County. My mother agreed to provide a, an equity loan against her home in order for me to obtain my mortgage. The loan sparked disagreements between Julie and some siblings, resulting in their mother being placed under the conservatorship of a fiduciary named Carolyn M. Young. It's something Julie is adamantly opposed to. I will never not be upset that we have this third party conservator. But the family is divided. One of her five siblings, Allison Schofield, is in favor of it. Allison declined our request to interview her, but in an email she said to us, quote, Julie Doherty is 100% the reason our family has Carolyn M. Young fiduciary overseeing our mother's estate, end quote. She also questioned Julie's motives. Their brother, James Doherty, appears to also be in favor. According to the court documents, he filed objecting to Julie as conservator and backing the appointment of Young. Their other sister, Michelle Vinyl, said she's formed cynical opinions of the conservatorship and that she agrees with Julie that, quote, Young and company, including all those interconnected from the judicial system and attorneys, down to the concierge, doctors and nurses, unquote, are all feeding from a, quote, parasitic trough that will deplete enough assets that should have been enough to endure for three lifetimes, unquote. The fifth sibling we never received a response from. Despite numerous requests for months, Carolyn Young would not grant us an on-camera interview, but she did answer some of our questions in writing. She provided us with a list of legal actions taken in Elsie's case, saying in part none of these actions were initiated by her, and in-home care are what's burdened the estate financially. As for what Julie's mom, Carol, thought about a conservatorship herself, it's shown in the court investigator's report. The report says that after interviewing Carol, they determined that she was, quote, opposed to the appointment of the proposed conservator, unquote. Sibling issues are so old they're even addressed in the Bible, but 2,000 years later, families go to the probate court for help. Where it gets sticky is suppose that your mom needs help and you and your siblings are at war with each other. The court's not going to appoint one sibling or the other to have control over mom when there are just these huge objections flying back and forth. So the court appoints a professional fiduciary to serve as conservator. Someone who's supposed to put the interest of the, it's called a conservatee, above their own interest. Acting in the best interest of the conservatee is a term used over and over again in probate code. But the interpretation of best interest is in the hands of the conservator, and some advocates believe it can be a slippery slope. For instance, Julie and her siblings' visitation schedule is what's best for their mother, according to the medical doctor hired by the conservator. But Julie finds it cruel. I don't want visitation. I want to be able to spend the night. I want to be able to hold her hand. I want to be able to sit next to her and reassure everything's okay, just like most families do with their loved ones. According to court documents, disputes about visitation between siblings was occurring before the conservator was appointed by the court. No matter which way you look at it, you can see time with their mother is being impacted. 
time that may be running out. Carol is 87 and has multiple chronic conditions, including dementia. In February, she was admitted to hospice care. Bye, Mom. I love you. But once a conservatorship is appointed, it can be very difficult to terminate. When and if I take on a conservator, that conservator is not using his or her own money. They're using the conservatee's money to defend. It's as though someone uh, goes and robs a bank and is caught and says, well, the good thing is I have a lot of money for attorney's fees. In the probate code, there is a procedure to file a petition to terminate, but you're going to be opposed by the conservator. Why does the conservator get a say in it when they're a third party? Because it pays so well. Conservatorship is about money. It's about billable hours and the more they can keep you coming into court. When fighting a conservatorship, multiple parties come before a judge. The conservator, the conservator's attorney, the court appointed attorney, a guardian ad litem if there's one. In some cases, they appoint a guardian ad litem. In some cases, they have a number of different experts who come in. They all get paid from mom's estate. According to Carol, Julie's mother's conservatorship accountings filed through the court between November 2017 and January 2020, the court approved over $265,000 in fees for Young, Young's attorney, and the conservatee's court-appointed attorney. This includes a nine-day trial where Young and her attorney defended the conservatorship with them prevailing. Between court fees, the price of in-home caregiving, and the cost of living, accounting show the estate has been charged over a million and a half dollars in the last four years since the conservatorship began. The second accounting shows just under 1.3 million has been transferred from the trust. Young said the significant costs associated with all litigation combined with the cost of Carol's care are the overwhelming cause of the depletion of the trust. The worst part, more than my mother losing her assets, is that my mother has lost her family. I've been robbed of time with my mom. But even if you think your family's wishes are set via your trust and will, Lisa says you should think twice. And we discovered that all of her estate planning documents have been changed. Our interview occurred two days before Linda was evaluated by a doctor who declared her incapacitated, saying she has severe cognitive decline and that Linda doesn't show, quote, knowledge that she's being conserved. It's this what these other people come along and want to interfere with your life, you know. But according to court records, Linda's cognitive slip happened over the last year. In September 2019, less than a year before being declared incapacitated, Linda signed a state planning documents appointing Carolyn Young and her son Zach Young to serve as trustee and potential conservator of a state if warranted. A new will was created, our family trust was changed and a new trust was created. There were new trustees put in place. In the medical evaluation, it says Linda's legal counsel asserted she had relevant civil capacities to create these estate plans. All this was very surprising because for the past 22 years, my mom has had the same estate planning documents. The trust has been the same. And we just assumed that it would be that way and left alone the way that my mom and dad set it up. When we asked Young Fiduciary Services about changing clients' trust, they noted how this must be done through a court petition in order, giving beneficiaries the ability to object and saying this is extremely rare. So even if you made your trust years or decades ago, a conservator can come in and change it? They can. They can now they petition the court for the change and it's fairly common, but it can also be terrible it could be cutting out other beneficiaries. Good times, bad times, hard times, you know. They went through a lot together. But, um, her and my dad made this trust and they thought, my mother thought it was set. It was gonna be okay.
Jamie's mother passed away in August 2000, leaving behind her stepfather, Jack, who she regards as her father. He was always my rescuer. But when Jack's mental and physical abilities started declining, as trustee, Jamie knew it was time for her to become the rescuer. So she sought legal help. I didn't know what a trustee was supposed to be doing. That's why I hired them. She said her attorneys immediately began recommending that she hire a fiduciary. Every time I was around him, it was give it to a private fiduciary. Over a month later, Jamie Amy decided to abide by her attorney's advice and relinquished her role as trustee, as well as granted a conservatorship of her father to a fiduciary they recommended named Carolyn Young. They told me when Carolyn Young became the conservator, she takes care of everything with Jack. It's a similar story for Catherine. My dad's attorney, Todd Roby, was trying to suggest to my dad that maybe they hire this woman, Carolyn Young, to help them with their finances. While Catherine's story is different, it ended in the same way Jamie's did, with her parent being placed under a conservatorship. And despite this occurring five years ago with her mother passing away in 2016, she's still in litigation. Because of this, she requested we not use her last name. Catherine says her father appointed one of their caregivers to serve as co-trustee because they considered them family. I was not living here. That was really my dad's big concern of kind of like making sure that my mom's caregivers would not leave her. The other trustee was their granddaughter who was age 25. Catherine said her father's attorney encouraged both trustees to enact a conservatorship. The odd thing is, is that this could still take place when my mother was against it, my brother, myself, so direct relatives more so. And that's just the court system. We've already shown you how family disagreements often lead to conservatorships. But another common way conservatorships are instated is through the recommendation of attorneys. I do have my favorite fiduciaries, but they're my favorites because I think they actually look out for the client. But some are concerned about fiduciaries that look out for themselves and those who work with them rather than the client. Not following the wishes of the client is something Jim Marshall said he saw in the Sacramento probate system in the 29 years he served as a court investigator. The corruption is, is, is to frustrate the intent of the trustor. The person who is relying on another to protect them to protect their estate during and after their lifetime. However, not all fiduciaries are doing that. And do you believe that corruption is happening here in the Sacramento County Probate Court now? Yes. Our investigation found a way of corruption is by a loophole with the trust. A way of directly attaining access to a client's funds is by getting onto their trust. It might be because the maker of that trust doesn't have a close relative that they feel like they can depend upon, so they interview a professional fiduciary. Once you petition the court to get on the trust, it's the end of the court's oversight. The trust has basically three or four parties. It has the maker of the trust, the trustee who is in charge of assets and applying directions to the trust, and beneficiary who is supposed to benefit from assets in the trust. It's set up in a way where oversight is written in. And because you have that, it doesn't have to go through a probate court. While that can help avoid expensive legal fees, it can also be detrimental if the trustee doesn't execute it in the way the maker of the trust wanted. Specifically here in Sacramento, Jim saw how using the trust changed the conservatorship business. The legal community moved away from the oversight that was inherent in the conservatorship process. He believes a combination of resources tightening within the public guardian's office plus going around the court with trusts was how the conservatorship business evolved from public to private. Their fees and the fees of their private fiduciary clients had to be approved by the court. So a workaround is that if the trust is set up in such a way that there's no review, you charge what fees you want, then you get your fees automatically. In the 80s, Jim says there was a mass exit of a group of professionals from the Sacramento County Probate Court to the private side. Carolyn Young, who was at the Public Guardians, she was one of the first private fiduciaries that I had ever heard of. 
and it was the start of a successful business for Young. I think she's the leading licensed fiduciary in Sacramento. According to annual statements to the Professional Fiduciary Bureau, in her 2020 statement, Carolyn Young reported managing over $111 million. The other fiduciaries in her business are her two children, Zach Young and Lindsay Bowman. For 2020, Zach reported managing $135 million, and Lindsay reported managing over $30 million. Altogether, that's nearly $277 million of other people's assets Carolyn, Zach, and Lindsay of the Young Fiduciary Business manage. In a statement to us, Young said in 35 years as a professional fiduciary, she's handled over a thousand cases. She also said that those cases have involved several thousand reports to the court for review of my actions. In no case has the court or the Professional Fiduciary Bureau ever found that I've breached my fiduciary duties. We combed through those probate court cases and we found a pattern, the same attorneys working with Young. The continuing education of the bar's California conservatorship practice says most courts will not appoint an attorney for a proposed conservatee if that same attorney has represented the conservator in other cases. From January 2010 to September 2020, we discovered 56 out of 84 cases where a number of the same attorneys represented Young. In 44 of those cases, she was represented by an attorney named Tosh Yamamoto. In the other 12 cases, she was represented by attorneys Leland Ellison, Judy Carver, Todd Roby, and Barbara Bender. We found three out of the 56 cases where these same attorneys who represented Young then represented the conservatee in other cases where Young was petitioning to be conservator. You later kind of find out all the kinds of things and how intertwined it is. Many involved in these cases we spoke with believe when the same attorney represents conservators, conservatees, and even different family members in multiple cases, it's a conflict of interest. When we showed our findings of the same attorneys working with the same fiduciary to the California State Bar and asked if this qualifies as a conflict of interest, they refused to comment and suggested that we seek an outside expert. So we went to Professor Melissa Brown. Sacramento really is a small legal community. And conservatorship law is complex, making it a smaller number of attorneys who specialize in it. So with the probate court, it's likely you'll see many of the same attorneys handling the same types of cases. She said attorneys cannot represent multiple parties in the same case. That's a clear conflict of interest. But if you finished one case with another fiduciary and a family or the court appoints you in, uh, in another case to represent the proposed conservatee, I don't, I mean, I don't think that's a conflict. The small number of attorneys who specialize in this field here in Sacramento is something we witnessed firsthand. Months after we interviewed Mike Hackard, he began actively investigating a case against Carolyn Young. Does she and the attorneys that work with her kind of have a reputation in the legal community? Well, the, the reputation is generally, if, if she's or members of her family, let's say, are the conservator, you can pretty well guess who are, the attorneys are going to be. And that's a natural thing, probably utilizing the same counsel. The probate court is, it's an old boys, old girls club. But some of the small amount of Sacramento attorneys in this field have not been comfortable when potential clients try to fight the conservatorship system. To find an attorney in Sacramento that doesn't have a conflict with Todd Roby or Carolyn Young or Tosh Yamamoto is impossible. How many do you think you? 10. Yeah, and then I had other ones that just wouldn't take it on because it was complicated. I couldn't find any help. Okay, I was just down to the bottom of the barrel. And many we spoke with have lost faith in our judicial system because of this. There is no oversight or accountability. That's what's really sad. Because they know it's wrong and they still do it anyhow and they're still being paid. And that's the problem. You look at the motivation. The Professional Fiduciary Bureau was created in 2007 in legislation that was sparked after an LA Times investigation exposed multiple abuses happening by conservators. It's a huge nationwide problem. 
Abuse by fiduciaries, particularly conservators, is something Carol Herman has been tracking. She's the founder of the national nonprofit corporation Foundation Aiding the Elderly. I mean, I've done this work over 30 years and I've been aware of this public guard of the guardianships and the conservators uh, for years. And I've got nine banker boxes full of cases. That's why she was all for the creation of the Bureau. I was instrumental in getting the fiduciary board established in California. I testified at the legislature uh, with my experience and why I felt there was a need for it. According to the Professional Fiduciaries Act, the Bureau was created to regulate non-family member professional fiduciaries. And professional fiduciaries handle a lot of other people's money. The Bureau lists each licensed fiduciary and how much money they oversee. We went through the Bureau's online records and added it up. It estimated to just under $13 billion of other people's assets fiduciaries handle. That's just in California. While the Bureau tracks the money fiduciaries handle, they don't keep tallies on the amount of clients they have under their care. I'd want to know how many people more than how much money. This is the issue where they're putting dollars above human beings. It's a lot of money and power, and the establishment of the Professional Fiduciary Bureau was intended to create oversight. So I thought, well, this is great. There's an agency within the government that if you have a problem, you can file a complaint and the investigators go in and, and investigate these conservatorship cases to see, well, what's really going on here? Well, it didn't happen. I believe I was the first person in the state to file official complaints. She believes it was the first complaint ever filed in California. It was against a fiduciary we've introduced you to in our investigation, Carolyn Young. You know, this was a lot of work. To, to put a complaint together and nobody did anything about it. Carol says she never received any written response to her complaint. She said on October 18th, 2011, over two and a half years after she filed the complaint, she got a phone call from the PFB saying they closed the complaint. While the PFB says every complaint filed gets an acknowledgement letter after 10 days, long wait times for resolutions is something we've heard over and over again from multiple people we've spoken with throughout our investigation, including Julie Doherty. And I have filed a complaint on the California Pro Professional Fiduciaries Bureau. It took the PFB 18 months to respond, saying they found insufficient evidence to her complaint and referred her back to the probate court, closing their investigation. According to the notes from the Bureau's meetings, the PFB receives around 135 complaints each year. In a statement to us, they said they investigate every complaint. But when we dug deeper, our investigation found the reason behind the delay in response to complaints. We requested a full list of every employee that works for the PFB. In response, we got a staff list of three, one being the person who does investigations, Sue Lowe. This means the Professional Fiduciary Bureau, the only state agency overseeing fiduciaries, has only one person to investigate hundreds of detailed complaints. For three years, there were 408 complaints filed by the public. Exactly zero complaints re re resulted in any disciplinary action. I'm sorry, I don't buy those numbers. You do not get 408 complaints from the public and not one be a violation. Richard Calhoun and Linda Kincaid are the co-founders of CEDAR. It stands for Coalition for Elder and Disability Rights. If I don't change the system, I'll be a victim. I'd rather kill myself than be a future target the way the system is now. They monitor case after case of conservatorships in California, and one of their biggest concerns is lack of oversight by the Professional Fiduciary Bureau, especially regarding complaints. In one case, a fiduciary actually killed her client. She withheld food and hydration, and he died. And the court ordered her to restore food and hydration, and she did after three days, but that was too long and he died. And I turned that in to the Professional Fiduciaries Bureau. Every single one of those cases, they found no violation of license. That's because the Professional Fiduciary Bureau does not investigate criminal activity. They say they don't do these types of investigations because they're a licensing agency. The Bureau told us that they are not a law enforcement agency and do not have the authority by law to conduct criminal investigations. If you believe a crime has occurred, you should contact law enforcement to submit those allegations. Law enforcement believes that once you're conserved, you no longer are entitled to law enforcement protection. The law enforcement says, oh, that goes to adult protective services, which are social workers. So you end up with less protection once you turn 65. 
This means that when abuse happens in a conservatorship, the PFB will direct those concerned about the abuse to law enforcement, and law enforcement directs them to adult protective services. And it gets even more nuanced than that because most of the conservatives are in facilities, and adult protective services only provide service for people in the community. So they don't even provide service in the uh, facilities. The PFB has never cited any licensee for any issues related to care. This is in spite of the Bureau being created to regulate professional fiduciaries and their code of ethics saying the protection of the public shall be the highest priority for the Bureau as well as in the California Code of Regulations that fiduciary licensees must comply with all local, state and federal laws, regulations and requirements. It's okay to kill your client. That's not a violation of your license. The only things that they're issuing citations on are you didn't submit your paperwork on time. You didn't pay your licensing fee on time. Now that'll get you a citation. There are a few cases where licensees have lost their license. That happens after some other court finds a problem, does an investigation, goes through whatever months, years are required for the courts to grind through these cases. Thank you for confirming that you do nothing until there is a conviction and you let people operate who have done horrible things and unless they're convicted, it's all okay with you guys. Thank you for that confirmation. When the Professional Fiduciary Bureau does take action, these documents become public records. So far, there's been 78 fiduciaries that have been reprimanded by the Bureau. Now, we went through each and every one of these documents to see what the Bureau has taken action against. And what we found is one of the most common reasons fiduciaries are cited is for submitting their annual accountings late. But Linda and Richard say auditing and accounting wasn't being done before their organization brought it to the PFB's attention. They only started auditing the statements because we were tormenting them about it. It doesn't add up. There's money missing. Linda and Richard found that multiple fiduciaries' annual statements to the PFB weren't in alignment with court records. I look at her, her annual statements to the PFB, and she's reporting, you know, the first year she reported that she didn't have any prior cases, I think. Like, well, actually she's had hundreds. And that's how we got the, the audits rolling by doing a few of these is like, oh my, the court records don't agree with what you have in your annual statements. This doesn't make sense. When we asked the PFB about how their auditing process works, they said they cannot discuss it. Some of the citations we found that the PFB has issued but didn't end in a license being revoked includes a fiduciary in San Diego County who forged client signatures on multiple documents, including checks and a pink slip, as well as sold a car without the client's knowledge. In Contra Costa County, a fiduciary was fined by the PFB after she entered a nursing home with a notary and attempted to have a patient already diagnosed with Alzheimer's sign documents that would make her the conservator. All of these fiduciaries licenses are still active. Donna Kell, professional fiduciary, Sacramento. One of the few fiduciaries the Bureau has investigated is Donna Kell. Experts we spoke with said the investigation was likely sparked because when the complaint came in, a Kell sat on the PFB's advisory committee, a committee appointed to oversee and guide the Bureau. The report of the Bureau's investigation showed multiple clients of Akel who were not served in their best interest. The report showed Akel liquidated a client's stock in 2015 without their knowledge to make a full cash purchase on a home which she named herself on the deed as co-owner. She allowed her daughter to rent her client's home for a rate under the market from 2015 to 2018 and charge utilities to the client's estate, hired her brother to serve as caregiver, used her client's credit card to make purchases on her Amazon account and even gave a client's military jacket to her uncle without the client's knowledge, among other charges. The Professional Fiduciary Bureau issued a citation as well as an accusation that resulted in Akel surrendering her license on October 27, 2020. We reached out to Donna Kell. She declined to answer our questions. I think there's some good private fiduciaries out there, but I think there's also a lot that aren't. And I think it's the responsibility of this fiduciary board to protect the, uh, the vulnerable citizens of this state. I think what my case exemplifies is the impossibility of getting help. There is simply no way to get help. 
A phone call on July 2nd, 2010 changed the course of Linda's life. I was just freaking out. I just, I couldn't believe it. July 2nd, she called me. Just out of the blue, I get this phone call from my mother. Linda's mother, who had started showing signs of dementia, was able to use her cell phone to tell her daughter she had been taken out of her home and placed in an assisted living facility. And I get down there and the facility is saying, you're not allowed to see her, you can't go in. Linda believes her mother had been targeted because of her wealth and dementia. Her tax preparers went to her house broke in the door, took her out, and hid her in a facility. I have a photograph of the wood of the door frame splintered where the deadbolt broke through the wood. The tax repairer admitted to forced entry during this deposition given to us by Linda. Well, you broke into the home, right? I broke the frame. And there was a, there was a locked door that you pushed hard enough that the door opened, correct? Correct. In her deposition, she said she forced entry to help Linda's mother, Carol, move because it was an unsafe environment for Carol and the man she lived with at the time was abusive to her. But court documents say that Carol and her companion had resided together for years and had treasured moments together. Linda told ABC 10 her mother's partner was not abusive ever and that he and her mother adored each other. Have you ever, during the time that you were with Carol, have you ever struck her? Never. You ever abused her in any way? Never. Five days after Linda's mother was taken from her home, her estate planning documents were changed and she was placed under the conservatorship of a step-granddaughter, someone of no blood relation. Linda, her only daughter, said she had no idea any of this happened until a month later when her mom called her. You can't mentally process that something like this can happen. You know, people at the time would ask me, what country was she in? Southern California. Linda said she had no access to her mom for 15 months, allowing the door for abuse to occur. Court documents say her mother wanted to have visits from her daughter. These documents also show the facility she was placed in were instructed not to allow any visitors besides the conservator. So ours was no visitation for about 15 months, then we did finally get limited visitation. And when we got in to see her, it was, well, she didn't know who I was anymore at that point. She was skin and bones. And we found out in litigation that she wasn't getting fed. Linda says her mom was abused financially, physically, and she believes even sexually. People say, well, can you prove this? Well, no, I wasn't in the room. I didn't see it happen. I can't prove that it happened, but there are facility records showing that my mom had vaginal bleeding over a period of time. Linda's mother had a hysterectomy prior to this. There are records both from the facility and for hospice and from Kaiser showing that my mother went by ambulance to the emergency room for vaginal bleeding. Shortly after the bleeding, Linda says the facility terminated a male caregiver that worked alone at night. There are these records where everyone has to fill out what they did at what time, and it shows who was on what shift. Uh, when we were in discovery and we were trying, we were requesting records from the facility, we, we want all of your care records for this time period. Like, well, they can't find the records for the six weeks before she went to the ER. In a deposition when questioned about sexually assaulting Linda's mother, the male caregiver pled the fifth. Have you ever been alone with Carol Hahn in a restroom facility? Again, I'm going to direct the witness to assert his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. Well, they lose the care records, they terminate the male caregiver, and they really quickly transfer my mom out to another facility. The new facility is where Linda's mother passed away in 2013. Following her death, Linda sued multiple people involved, including her mother's conservator and the care facility for assault, negligence, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. It remains the longest civil trial in San Bernardino County. And while the jury found in Linda's favor, the judge declared a mistrial after releasing one of the jurors. Linda said the trial alone cost around a million dollars. That's why they decided not to retry it. The outcome of her mother's conservatorship outraged Linda. That the system is very broken and the system will not change until we as citizens residents of california demand that change 
That's why she co-founded the nonprofit CEDAR, the Coalition for Elder and Disability Rights, with her partner Richard Calhoun. CEDAR was created in 2014 to promote rights for California conservatives, but trying to change the system hasn't been easy. If you want to talk about a lone wolf, I walked these halls for the first time on this topic on July 19, 2010 and everybody looked at me like I was crazy. In 2010, 11, 12, nobody heard of the topic. No one would believe it. Today, they're the few, if only, conservatorship advocates in California, let alone the United States, and they're well-versed on nearly every aspect of the complex field. Their drive is sparked by their own trauma, unlike the many others competing for elected leaders' attention. We will work with anybody that will work with us, but it is difficult. We're, we're competing with lobbyists, and lobbyists are getting paid $1,000 an hour, and we're getting paid nothing and we're self-funding our expenses. But when they do get legislators' attention, it's proven to be powerful. The stumbling block for CEDAR has been getting a elected official, one of the 40 senators or one of the 80 assembly members, to introduce our bills. Once our bills are introduced, they pass. They pass with flying colors. Three out of the four bills CEDAR has sponsored pass unanimously. The fourth had a vote of 100 in favor to four opposed. A bill they, as well as other conservatorship reform advocates like attorney Tom Coleman, have supported is AB 1194, which will become law on January 1st, 2022. It requires the judge to allow the person to have the attorney of their choice. Other changes include creating communication between courts and the Professional Fiduciary Bureau, the state agency entrusted in overseeing fiduciaries that serve as conservators requiring more transparency like specific data on the number of conservatorships statewide to be reported, and more requirements for court investigators like talking to first-degree family members prior to the appointment of a conservatorship. But it's not the first piece of legislation that's made an attempt to change this multi-billion dollar industry that controls the lives and money of others. In a 2007 Reform Act, a nearly identical bill was passed here in California, but failed to change anything. We found that a huge effort to reform the system in 2006 did not take effect due to the toxic economic recession that started in 2008. But Assemblymember Lowe, who introduced AB 1194, hopes his bill will create the change the system needs. Does your bill give funds or does it address that? Because it's kind of doing the same thing the 2007 Reform Act did if it doesn't. Right. Part of the legislative proposals that we have too is ensuring that we have the policy that was supported and make sure that there are the resources to empower local communities to implement the law. For other activists, they believe it's a step in the right direction, but the first of many needed. There's no magic wand approach. It's not instant reform. AB 1194 is a tool that's going to help those of us that are committed to this reform keep pushing step by step. Our investigation began in early 2020, hearing from a conservatee herself. I don't know what's going to happen to me. Throughout this year, we've spoken to many experts. No oversight. This process is going to take away your mom's rights. You are supposed to put the interest of the person ahead of your own interest. Court insiders. And do you believe that corruption is happening here in the Sacramento County Probate Court now? Yes. And victim? I've been robbed of time with my mom. After victim? My last days with my mom were spot in court. To uncover a nearly $13 billion system in California susceptible to abuse. This is a flaw in our system. That can and has caused traumatic emotional, physical, and financial harm to our elders. No family should go through it. It was hard enough on me, but to watch my mother, who's lived this wonderful, wonderful life, to have it taken away from her, no one should suffer that way. 